Now you have John chapter 16, and let's begin reading at verse 7 through 11. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I should like to repeat for you that wonderful eighth verse. And when he, the Holy Spirit, is come, he will convict or reprove or convince the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Probably no verse in the entire New Testament is more often misquoted than this verse. Quite frequently, most of the time, it is quoted as follows, and he, when he is come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment to come. But you will notice that is not what the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about. He's not talking about a future judgment. He's talking about a judgment which is already accomplished. Of judgment because the prince of this world is or has already been judged. Now we can forgive the misquotation when we realize that there is another very, very similar verse with which it is confused, found in the 24th chapter of the book of Acts in the 25th verse, where Paul is on trial before Felix. And as he speaks to him, we read, and as he reasoned of uh, uh, righteousness and temper and judgment to come, Felix trembled and said, Go thy way for this time, at a more convenient hour or time I will call for thee. Now here we have two convictions. In the 16th chapter of John we know this is the conviction of the Holy Spirit and results in salvation and peace and assurance. In the 24th chapter of the book of Acts we have a different conviction which may simulate and imitate real genuine Holy Ghost conviction except that it does not have the same end result but it results in trembling and conviction and maybe tears and confession and prayers and even a testimony and yet is entirely unproductive of any spiritual lasting effects. And we call it the conviction of conscience, which alone can never save a man. Only as the conviction of conscience is made effective by the conviction of the Holy Spirit can it produce any lasting spiritual fruit or results. And because they are so similar, because they are so often confused, it is of the utmost importance that we ask ourselves, on what do I base my hope of salvation? The fact that I raised my hand, the fact that I came forward, the fact that I knelt at a chair or an altar, the fact that I prayed, the fact that I got up and testified, or was it a real work of grace? Now we know that many, many people convicted by conscience because they're disturbed, because probably the law is after them, or they're in deep trouble, they've gotten themselves involved in an intricate situation, will seek for a way out, and will make a pretense of accepting the Lord Jesus Christ, and then when the trouble is over and the danger has passed, they lapse again into their same indifference, and the end is worse than the beginning. And so it is important that we do not base our, our hope of salvation on any emotion, which may not be the result of a spiritual experience at all, but upon the solid, basic rock of the testimony of the Word of God as given by the Holy Spirit. Now there is a tremendous difference between the conviction of conscience and the conviction of the Holy Spirit, not only as to the end result, for the conviction of the Holy Spirit brings peace. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace while the conviction of conscience only results in procrastination. I will see thee again at a more convenient time. Putting it off as far as we know, Felix never came. 
to a knowledge of sins forgiven and being justified by the blood through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'd like to have you just note these in passing, that conscience uh, convicts a man of sins which he has committed, while the conviction of the Holy Spirit convinces of a man that his sins have been remitted, which is quite a different proposition. Then conscience can convict a man of a righteousness which he has failed to attain, a righteousness which had been forfeited. But the conviction of the Holy Spirit finally convinces this sinner who is being moved upon by the Holy Spirit of a righteousness of another one which has been imputed and has been reckoned to his account. And then the conviction of conscience convinces a man of judgment to come. And it may make him tremble, and it may make him weep, and it may make him cringe. But the conviction of the Holy Spirit convinces of a judgment which is past, of a perfect standing through the word of another. And so I'd like to look at the uh, wonderful uh, concentrated uh, explanation our Lord gives here of the genuine work of the Holy Spirit in convicting the world, in convicting the sinner and the steps by which it is accomplished. And so you will notice that there are three steps here. First of all, we read, And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And then there's an explanatory verse that follows. Of sin, because they've broken God's law. Of sin, because they have, have, have been blasphemers. They uh, have been thieves, and they have been murderers, and they have... No, it doesn't say that. It says of sin because they believe not on me. And how many people have missed the simplicity of this message? That there is only one sin that can ultimately send a man to hell, and that's the sin of rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ and the message of salvation. A man may be the biggest, the lowest, the meanest, the most, the most despicable, hell-ridden and devil-prodded, uh, bombing the gutter. The moment he puts his faith and trust in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, all of his sins are washed out and forgiven, and he stands as clean before God as though he had never committed a sin. While by the same token, a man may be the most religious, polished, cultured, educated, hymn-singing, prayer-chanting, church-attending, nominal Christian, usher, elder, deacon, trustee, or preacher, if he has not come as a poor, lost sinner and recognized the fact that he is the one who nailed that Son of God to the cross and puts his trust in him, he's as much lost as the most overt sinner in all the world. And that's the glory of the gospel. But that is the cosmopolitan gospel. That's the gospel that fits every single individual in the gamut and in the scale Socially, educationally, financially, or otherwise. And you can preach it anywhere you want. And so to preach the gospel, all you need to know is one message. That man is lost. And that his sins call for his condemnation. But Christ Jesus came on the cross and became the propitiation for our sins. And not ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. And the sin question has been settled by Jesus Christ 1900 years ago. And today it becomes a question of the sun. Not how big a sinner have you been, how long have you sinned, or how deep is your criminal record, but what have you done with Jesus, who is called a Christ? What a glorious message, what a marvelous message, what a wonderful gospel we have to preach. Whosoever will may come, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be like wool. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Don't let the amount of your sin stand in the way. The problem is not that you come with the amount of your sin, but denying the sin that is here so clearly indicated of sin, because they believe not on me. Now, I suppose that every evangelist has in his repertoire at least one sermon on the unpardonable sin. And they freely advertise it and get a lot of mentally deficient and doubting folks into their audience. And when they get through preaching on the unpardonable sin, about eight of them land in the asylum. 
imagining that they have um, had, had committed the sin against the Holy Ghost. Now let me make this very clear. The Bible does not have one word to say about the unpardonable sin except one sin. And that's not blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, which was a national sin. The only unpardonable sin is continued rejection of Jesus Christ until it's too late and death closes the door. Oh, I wish that I could undo some of the things that have been, have been done by getting people upset and making them believe that because they had committed some sin or some act or had spoken some word or had some evil thought in the past, now they have committed a sin against the Holy Ghost. And there's no hope for them and it drives them mad. And instead of bringing them to salvation, they end up in a mental hospital. I want this to be clear, and I'm absolutely sure I'm right, that there is no sin that any man can commit which cannot be forgiven and washed out if a man is willing to come and receive Jesus Christ as his own personal Savior as the propitiation for his sin. And so I hope this will stick with you in the days that lie ahead of sin because of what? Let's repeat it. Of sin because they believe not on me. Let's repeat it, all of us. It's very short. Of sin because they believe not on me. Now those are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if there's anyone in here this morning and you have been led to believe that you may have committed some act, have done something in the past, in secret or public or whatever it may be, and that now there's no hope for you, let me tell you, it's the devil's lie. If you this morning, in simple faith, are willing to believe what Jesus has to say as the Spirit of God deals with you, you can go out of this tabernacle saying, I know whom I have believed. Not, I know how well I've behaved, or I know uh, how good I've lived. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he, not me, he is able to keep that which I have simply committed unto him against that day of sin because they reject the free offer of salvation. The sin question was settled 1900 years ago. The day of Samaritan the Sun. And if you cross out that capital I in the middle and make it a zero, you'll have the plan of salvation. Now that's the first thing the Spirit of God does. Convicts a man of the capital sin, the biggest sin that was ever committed by man was nailing the Son of God to the cross. Bigger than adultery, bigger than unfaithfulness, bigger than robbery, bigger than the murder of a fellow man. The greatest sin that was ever committed was the sin of crucifying the innocent, sinless Son of God. And God says, I've made that very sin the occasion whereby his shed blood could be the remission of the sins of those that murdered him. And if God can blot out the greatest sin, he can blot out all the lesser sins, if there is such a thing, at the lesser sins. I have often thought of that verse, which I was never able to fathom until recently, where sin did abound, grace did much more what? Where sin, let's repeat that, where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. Let me ask you, where did sin abound the most? Calvary. That's where sin abounded in the maximum, in the ultimate. There you have the real, final, positive demonstration of the sadism and the ugliness and the, and the terrible uh, unjustness of sin when they took the Son of God. And that's where grace abounded. I think that's what the verse means. Where sin abounded on that mountain, Calvary, that's where God's grace came into his boldest and most wonderful and glorious relief, where sin did abound, hallelujah, grace did much more about. 
And then having convicted the sinner of his awful sin, of being the murderer of the Lord Jesus, of rejecting him, because he said, he that believeth is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he believeth not in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. Then having done that, then the Lord comes through his Holy Spirit, and he convicts that sinner of a righteousness. That's the ray of hope. Although the sin is black and scarlet and crimson and deserves eternal help, there is hope, and that hope is in the righteousness of another which can be imputed to that poor sinner the moment he trusts the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I read here, of sin of righteousness and judgment to come sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness. And then he adds a strange ending there. Because I go to my Father, and you see me no more. Now what in the world has that got to do with the imputation of righteousness? Why does he introduce this? Because I go away to my Father. I'm going to leave you. I'm going to be gone. And you won't see me anymore. Well, he's talking about the conviction of the Holy Spirit. How are you going to know that the work is done? How do you know that when Jesus went into the Holy of Holies with his blood, that it was really accomplished? He didn't come back. He's been gone 1900 years. There'd been no voice from heaven, in spite of some people that hear voices. Hadn't been anything like that. How do I know? He said, I'll let you know. I'll send my messenger back. I'll send word back. The Holy Spirit. And he will come and tell you everything's all right. You know the definition of righteousness? I know you can go to your go to your commentaries and your theological books and you'll have page and page and page and page and page on the word righteousness. And you make up your mind whenever you go to a commentary that the less a man knows about the subject, the longer it'll take him to tell it. That's a hard and fast rule. And the more a man knows about a subject, the less time it'll take him to tell it. I become so disgusted with commentary. The verses I need light on, they're just as much in the darkness as I am. And the things I don't need light on, they've got page after page after page written about it. You've got to go through a whole stack of straw to find a couple of kernels of wheat hidden away somewhere. Now let me give you a definition of righteousness. Four words. Write them down. The word righteousness means everything is all right. Now that's simple, isn't it? It's too simple for some of you sophisticated people to accept it, isn't it now? Everything is all right. When I say that God is righteous, I say everything about him is all right. When I talk about the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, I say everything about him is all right. Nothing wrong with him. And when I talk about a saint who has been saved and clothed with the righteousness of Christ, I'm saying that in the sight of God, everything's all right with that individual. God sees nothing wrong in him because he is clothed in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus. Now, how are we going to know that that righteousness had been fully provided? He says, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Now, that introduces us to the priestly work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The sin question was his prophetic work in the past. Christ is prophet, priest, and king. His prophetic work, as far as our experience in time is concerned, is history. A prophet is one who comes from God with God's message to man. That's what he did when he came. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as dark as could be. Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin and dwelt among men, my Redeemer to be. God revealed his plan and will of salvation. When he sent Christ to the cross, he died and rose from the grave according to Scripture. That I know Christ always was prophet, priest, and king, and always will be. You won't misunderstand me or mis misquote me on that, I'm sure. But in the, in the dispensational plan, he was our prophet. Then he went to heaven and he became our 
high priest. As the prophet, he settled the sin question. As our high priest, he provides for our righteousness. And as a king, he's coming back again to judge the world and we being free of judgment because the prince of this world has been judged. Now, that threefold work of the Lord is past, present, and future. He hasn't left us hanging halfway up in the air. He hasn't said, now I've justified you, now you behave yourself and hang on. I'm sure you get there in the end. No, he made provision for past and for present and for future. He hasn't left us alone at all. Now, that takes care of the three aspects of our complete salvation. Justification, sanctification, glorification. Justified by faith in his shed blood, sanctified by his intercessory work in the present at the right hand of God, and glorified when he comes again. And that takes care of me, body, soul, and, bo and mind. Body, soul, and the spirit. When I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, I was immediately justified by the prophetic substitutionary work of the Lord Jesus. That's a finished work. Once for all, happened in the twinkling of an eye, when God saw that first spark of faith in our heart, before we could give a testimony or do anything else, God saw that little spark, of faith, which he put there, by the way, he reckoned us to be just, and he established our standing and our place in the body of Christ. But today in the heavens, he is dealing not with our spiritual justification, but with our soul, you all, sanctification. For while we're perfect in our spirit life, we're still very imperfect in our soul life. Life of our emotions and affections and loves and so forth. And so day by day, through the Spirit and the Word, He ministers to our sanctification until it's completed when we meet our Lord and Savior and are completely transformed into His image. But my body too must be redeemed. A lot of people think of salvation merely as, well, your, your soul going to heaven when you die. And you won't have to go to heaven. That's about all people. A lot of people think about salvation. Kind of a fire insurance policy. Rather cheap one too because it's all paid up for you. So that when you die, you won't have to go to hell. And there are a lot of people that if they were sure they couldn't go to hell, they wouldn't even dare go to heaven. Then you soon stay down here. You're having a pretty good time. I'm not going to go to hell. That's all awesome. Some people go a little farther and uh, they realize that when you get old and decrepit and your teeth fall out and you get knocked and eaten, arthritis and rheumatism and your gallbladder begins to bother and you begin to get rather decrepit and hobbling, well, it would be a nice place to go after we get through down here. And we can't enjoy things down here anymore. And so they want to go to heaven. But there's a lot of loose talk about that. But, beloved, that isn't all. We are going to be redeemed, not only spiritually, solely, right, but bodily. Someday I'm going to have a new body, a brand new body. I think I'll get my hair back. I'm going to shed these uh, false teeth. I'm going to get over that scar I got on the back of my heart that I got about 15 years ago. Uh, I, I'm going to have a body just like the body of the Lord Jesus. You see, redemption is a complete work. And so our Lord has made provision for my spiritual justification, my sanctification in time and in the soul. And ultimately, hallelujah, when we'll be complete like him, with a body like his, redeemed forevermore, never more to sin, never more to die, never more to fail, never more to become weary, never more to doubt, but praise him throughout the countless eons of eternity. Now, how do I know that? Well, Jesus says you'll only know it by the Holy Spirit and his message because I'm not coming back. Maybe I ought to illustrate this. Uh, Brother Purdy has given me a very gracious leeway this morning. He said about a quarter after twelve. So I figured on forty-five minutes I'm going to take an hour. Okay? Fine. Will you turn with me to the sixteenth chapter of the book of Leviticus? Now, remember, remember that the work of convicting of sin has to do with the work of the Lord as the prophet. That is, the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin, of rejecting him and the gospel. But the work of the Holy Spirit in imputing righteousness has to do with the work of Jesus. 
at the right hand of God interceding for us. That is, maintaining our righteousness for us. And so it is the picture of the priest. Now I believe that the most wonderful, marvelous, breathtaking, uh, absolutely uh, inexhaustible passage on the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ is not the 15th or the 16th or the 17th chapters of John. But I think you'll find it tucked away in that book you seldom read. The 16th chapter of the book of Leviticus. I wish that I had time if I ever get invited back again, which I probably won't. Uh, I, I'm going to give you a whole series on the 16th chapter of Leviticus of his glorious picture of our high priest and bearing upon this of righteousness because I go to my father and ye see me no more. Now this was the day of atonement, the 16th chapter. There were seven feasts in the economy of Israel. First of all there was the Passover that was brought on leavened bread, that's his burial. Then we have the first fruits, that's his resurrection. Then comes Pentecost. That of course we know what it is, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Then after a period of about seven months we have the trumpet, which speaks of the rapture. Then came the day of atonement. And of all the feast days in Israel, the feast of atonement was the most solemn, the busiest, the busiest, more crowded more into this long chapter than anywhere else. More space is given to the day of atonement than any other feast day in the economy, the religious economy of the children of Israel. And on this day, I'll try and be as brief as I can, on this day, one day in the year, it was never repeated more than once a year, which stood for all time. It was a complete work. One day in the year, the high priest, in his glorious, wonderful high priestly garments of pure white linen and gold and scarf and purple and blue, would go into the temple or the tabernacle and order all the rest of the priests and Levites out, out, take your place among the common multitude on the outside. All distinction now on that day are wiped out. You become one of the common people. Go out there in your plain common priestly garments. And then the priest went alone. All by the one day in the year that the priest went alone into the tabernacle of the congregation and alone by himself. He sacrificed oxen and sheep and goats. It was a busy ritual all day long while the other priests were all on the outside. But as the priest went in, and he could go in only once a year, and if he didn't follow the instructions, he would be smitten, struck dead on the spot, and all the work of intercession would come to a halt and would fail completely. He would go into this tabernacle, into the holy place, and he would take off his garments. He would disrobe himself, take off the ephod, and the robe of the ephod, and the breastplate, and the girdle, and the belt, and the mitre, and stand for one brief moment naked. Stark naked in the sight of God. And then he would pick up the ordinary linen garments of the common priesthood, the breeches, unattractive, plain, and the linen coat, and the plain white nurse's cap or linen mitre. And in that garb of a common priest, having laid aside it, glorious garments of the high priest. He went to the altar and he sacrificed. First of all for himself, because the high priest was himself imperfect. He was only a male. And then for the people and shed rivers of blood. Then he would take the two goats, the one for a scapegoat and the other for a sacrifice, signifying the carrying away of the sin. But the climax of it all came when after he had made an end of all these sacrifices, he would take a chalice of blood, take him from these sacrificial animals, and then he would disappear into the Holy of Holies. 
And there for a moment he stood in the presence of the awful Shekinah glory. And he took the blood and he sprinkled it on the mercy seat under which reposed a broken law. A law that damned and cursed the people on the outside. Because the ministry of the law is death, not life. It is cursing, not blessing. It is judgment, not salvation. But God had once promised that when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. And so this high priest took that blood and he sprinkled it on the mercy seat. And when God came down between the broken law and God was a mercy seat with blood on it. And he passed over. And that was the end of the high priestly work on the day of atonement until he came out of it. But all of this was done in silence. There is not one word in this book that tells us that the priest breathed one word because the blood speaks. All he had to do was present the blood. Now tradition, Jewish tradition tells us that when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies, he breathed that mystic word, Yahweh, the name Jehovah which was an unknown name, we only think it was that, and was transmitted from high priest to high priest, but the people never knew that magic name because it was such a terrible thing to take it in vain. But God wouldn't even reveal it to them. But be that as it may, you don't have to believe it. Here we, he came into the tabernacle. He had unrobed himself. Now, the clothes that he had laid down I wish you'd read it in the book of Exodus. What a glorious, glorious sight this man must have been. God gave meticulous and very, very detailed instruction as to the making of this robe. He had on, first of all, a, an ephod, which was made with embroidered, beautiful white linen with gold and blue and purple and scarlet. And then he had on the robe of the ephod, equally embroidered with all of these suggestive colors, the blue, the heavenly nature, purple, the kingly uh, nature of the, of the great high priest of whom it was only a type. And of course the scarlet speaking of sacrifice and the gold speaking of authority and of deed and the white of course speaking of it's all right, of righteousness. And he had on this garment and at the border, the bottom border of this garment, there were alternately hung little pomegranates, speaking of the blood and the death. And then next to it was a little golden bell, which speaks of resurrection and victory. And then a pomegranate, and then a bell, and then a pomegranate, and then a bell, alternately, all around the hem of this robe of the ephah. So that whenever the priest moved, made the slightest move, tinkle, 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 the bells were ringing. So that when he was in there, the people outside would know the priest was in there doing his work. That's very definitely stated that the Lord wanted him to do that in order that they might hear the bells as they sent forth their message of life and hope. Then he had a breastplate, which was a sort of a, uh, <laughs> I hardly know how to describe it. it, it was a pouch. And it, it was square. And it had in it a pocket. And it was attached to, with two golden chains to a, a couple of golden plates on the shoulder. And on those golden plates were the names of the children of Israel, six on each side. And then on this breastplate were twelve precious stones in four rows, three in a row. All the names of the children of Israel. The priest carried the children of Israel on his shoulder, speaking of power and security and protection. And he carried them over his heart, the place of love and devotion and tenderness. And then inside the pouch were two stones, a black one and a white one, a black ball and a white ball. And they're called the Urim and the Thumb. Now, they didn't have any written word. And so when anybody wanted to know the will of God, they'd go to the priest and say, I've got a question. I want you to answer it. 
And the high priest would put his hand down in the pouch and pick out a stone. If it was a white stone, the answer was yes. And if it was a black stone, the answer was, I guess that's what the lodgers get their blackballing of, of members or something. Now, we have the word of God. We have the revelation. We don't need to shake dice in order to know the will of the Lord. They did that in Jonah's day. And later, but now with the complete revelation of Scripture, we have the voice of the Holy Spirit, which is, and we don't need these contraptions anymore. Now then, he had on addition a mitre, beautiful blue mitre, and on it was a golden plate, and on that golden plate was inscribed holiness. Unto the Lord, separated completely unto the service of of God. Now the priest laid aside those garments and they had heard him walking around in the tabernacle and they knew he was going into the Holy of Holies to complete the work by sprinkling the blood all of a sudden the bell stopped ringing and everything was quiet and they knew that the high priest had taken off his beautiful robes and laid them aside. And in the garb of an ordinary priest, he was taking the blood to sprinkle it on the mercy seat. It was a moment of awful suspense. For if the priest failed to meet all the conditions of righteousness he'd be struck dead on the spot it had happened before Nadab and Abihu the two sons of Aaron had brought strange fire and God smote them and killed them on the spot and so while the priest was there in the holy of holy silence the folks were holding their breath as it were praying that he might not fail because it meant the judgment of God. If they did, there's an old rabbinical tradition. I don't know how much truth is in it. I don't put any credence in it. I just uh, give it to you as a breather in, in these tense moments. And that is that they tied a string to the big toe of the priest when he went in. Okay? So that in case anything should happen to him while he was in there, they could pull him out without going in there and coming themselves under the judgment of God. Just to show you how, how, how tremendously important they regarded this work of the high priest as he went in. And so as the high priest went in, they won him. Now look at that 16th chapter, and I point out two or three verses, and then will bring it all back to mind. you gather it up. Look at the first verse of the 16th chapter. And the Lord spake unto Moses, What's the next word? After what? After the death of two sons of Aaron when they offered before the Lord. What are the next two words? What was the penalty of not observing every rule of righteousness? Death. Now this is the background against which the Day of Atonement is recorded. The death of two priests who had failed to make proper atonement and had offered strange fire, and God killed him. And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark. What are the next four words? That he die not. You see, the penalty was death for any infraction of the rules, for I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. Now look at the fourth verse. He shall put on the holy linen coat, that was the ordinary coat of the ordinary priest. And he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh, and shall be girded with a linen girdle, and with a linen mitre shall he be attired. These are holy garments, therefore shall he wash his flesh in water, and so put them on. Now he's taken off his high priestly garment, with the bells on it, and in silence. Now the rest of the work is going to be accomplished. And then we read, and uh, in the 13th verse, And he shall put incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony 
What are the next four words? That he died not. He's making atonement. For what? For sin. What's the penalty of sin? Death. And this high priest, representing the nation, had to do it in perfection. And he shall take the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle the blood with his finger seven times. Then shall he kill the gold of the sin offering that is for the people and bring his blood within the veil and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock. Sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat and then the final act which left him in the Holy of Holies. And so I read in the 17th verse. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation all alone by himself when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy pit until he come out and have made an atonement for himself that was the type which Christ didn't have to do and for his household Christ only had to enter in once for he had no sin and for his household and for all the congregation of the Lord now in the 23rd verse now listen 23rd verse and Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of the congregation and shall put off the linen garment of the common priesthood which he put on when he went into the holy place and shall leave him there. And he shall wash his flesh with water in the holy place and put on his garment, his glorious high priestly garment and come forth and offer the burnt offering. And then, of course, the rest of it tells about all these different offerings, and 34th verse uh, puts it uh, all up. Yes, we'll skip that 32nd verse. And this shall be an everlasting statute unto you to make an atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he did as Moses commanded him. Now, here he is in the silence. And the people are wondering. I wonder if the priest is going to make a mistake. How are we going to know that all is well? And they waited for just one signal. The ringing of the bells. For if he was successful and came out of the Holy of Holies, the next thing, as we read, was that he would take off his common priestly garment and he would lift up the robe of the ephod. And when he did, tinkle, 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 went the little golden bell. And a great shout went up from the congregation on the outside as they praised the Lord and said, It's all right. Righteousness has been provided. He has been successful. It has not been a failure. And they took deep breath and went forth in the assurance that all had been taken care of by the house. Do I have to spend time in pointing you to the antitype? Have you ever seen a more glorious picture of the one who came down from heaven out of the ivory palaces into a world of war? who laid aside the beautiful form of God, whatever it was, I don't know and you don't know, and laid aside that transcendent glory and came and took upon himself the common garb of sinful men and came in human flesh and took his place among the congregation for whom the priest was to make atonement. And then in those linen garments, in that humanity, in that human nature, he went to the altar. And not only made a sacrifice, but became the sacrifice. Because the substance is always greater than the shadow. And the antitype far transcends the steeple type in the 16th chapter of the book of Leviticus. And there he shed his own precious blood. There he laid down his life. And then after he had done that, still in the garb of an ordinary priest. Alone, he made satisfaction. It was alone my Savior died upon the cruel tree 
Alone he paid the awful price that could set my spirit free. Alone he came, laid down his life that I might never die. Now he lives to keep me saved forever in heaven and heart. That's what Jesus did. And so when he had made the sacrifice, he rose from the grave, and then he went into the Holy of Holies. Forty days after his resurrection, he said, Now I'm going for the last act of the atoning work. I'm going to take the blood and bring it to heaven. And there sprinkle it upon the mercy seat. And Father will say, when I see the blood, I'll pass over. No golden bell. One day they stood and all of a sudden he was taken up into heaven and they said, we'll see once whether he's really going to finish it. But oh no, there's a veil in between. It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, of sin, because they believe not on me. Listen, of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and you see me no more. But listen, I'm going to send word back. I'm not going to leave you in suspense for 1,900 years. I'm not going to leave you in doubt. I'll send word back. And that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. If you'll turn to the fourth chapter of the book of Acts, for, for just one moment, uh, notice what Peter has to say in that remarkable sermon which so many of us overlook. It took me years after I was saved before uh, I saw this truth. But look at the fourth of Acts, the 29th verse, the fifth of Acts, pardon me, the 29th verse. Then Peter, uh, look it up in your Bible, I want you to see this. Uh, I just ask that you get 10% of the kick that I get out of bringing the message. I'll be satisfied. My, this is a wonderful thing. And so I read, then Peter, they had been enjoined not to speak anymore in the name of Jesus. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew, and hanged on a tree, him had God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior. How do you know? How do you know he's been exalted at the right hand of God? A prince and a savior. You didn't see him. The cloud prevented you from taking a peek. How do you know? Look at the rest of the passage. For to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. Let's all read the next verse in unison. You'll get more out of it. All together. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God has given to them that obey him. There's your answer. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father. And you see me no more, but I'll send a witness back. And in the mouth of two witnesses shall every word be established. And so we have two witnesses. First, the testimony of the apostles inspired by the Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit personally indwelling the believer to believe the testimony of the apostles. And so we have two witnesses. We have the 27 books of the, of the uh, New Testament. And we have the presence of the Holy Spirit to take this testimony and this witness and apply it to our heart. Turn to one other passage. Oh dear. 26th verse of the 14th of John. Just very quickly now. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he's talking to his apostle, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I've said unto you. Now that's not for us. That's for those who wrote the Bible. He said, when the time comes for the Holy Spirit whom I'm going to send to put down the record of the Word of God, I'm going to have the Holy Spirit bring 
all things to your remembrance so that you'll remember them. How could they remember it all? The Holy Spirit brought it to their remembrance. So that I have in this New Testament a perfect, infallible, impeccable record of the Word of God given by the Holy Spirit. And now, what is the witness of the Holy Spirit? For I must close, I promise to, and I have two minutes. It's this Word applied to our hearts by the Holy Spirit. The witness of the Holy Spirit is not icicles going down your back or hearing voices and sounds and hallucinations and delusions and dreams and uh, feelings and spinning like a top and yelling like a wild man, jibber jabbering in tongues or anything else. The witness of the Holy Spirit is when the Word, when the Spirit of God takes this book and applies it to your heart. Let me close again with uh, 1 John chapter 5. I believe I referred to it before. Verse 9. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. And this is the witness which he had given of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. Did you get that? It doesn't say he that has visions, revelations, voices, and, and strange emotions and feelings. And what have he that believeth on the Son of God hath a witness in himself. If you believe this book, that is the Holy Spirit's witness to your heart. And you either believe it or you don't. He that believeth on the Son of God hath a witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar. Why? Because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. What is the record? What is the record that God gave of His Son? Come on. There is no other. This book, this is the only record in existence of the Son of God. And God said, I want you to believe what the Holy Spirit has inspired these men as witnesses concerning the Son of God. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of His Son. And this is the record that God has given unto us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath the Son hath not life. Why do people stumble over the simplicity of the gospel? And then the last one I haven't time for. If you ever invite me back, I'll take it up. Listen. Of judgment. Because the prince of this world is just. Convicts us of sin then shows us that a righteousness has been provided by the Lord and that he has not left us in darkness but has sent the Spirit to testify of the completion of his work. And you and I are still waiting I can almost hear it in the distance Tinkle Tinkle He's coming back. No, he's been gone for 1900 years. He's coming back. Our high priest is going to come back. And as he comes back out of the Holy of Holies, he'll come back arrayed in the glory of his second coming. As John gives us the picture of the priest with his long white priestly robe, feet like burnished brass as though they burned in the fire, eyes like a flame of fire, and a voice like a thousand waters and his head many crowns and on his forehead the son of God one of these days the priest is coming back but I thank God I don't have to live a life of doubt and fear until he comes because I have his personal witness that everything is what? alright what? All right. Everything is all right. Do you know that everything is all right? That's the third work of the Holy Spirit of judgment because the prince of this world is dead. And if you have really trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, then the result is peace and assurance and joy. Being justified by faith, we have peace. My peace I give unto you. My peace I leave with you. Now does the world give it, give it unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. 
And so I want to ask you, are you at peace today? Do you have peace in heart? Can you say, I know, I know, because I have accepted a witness concerning the Son of God, of the Holy Spirit in the Word. I know whom I have believed. I'm saved. I'm justified. Then you can look with comfort and with joy to that glad day when he shall come with trumpet sound and not sing, Oh, may I then in him be found. But you can sing when he shall come with trumpet sound, Oh, then will I in him be found. Rest in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne.